We're going to look at Easter from the standpoint of commemorating Jesus' crucifixion. Now, what does it mean to commemorate? Well, simply put, we could say to remember it and pay it honor and respect. 2,000 years ago, approximately, a Jewish carpenter was condemned as a dangerous religious and political rebel. His name was Jesus. He was executed in one of the most painful and shameful punishments ever known, flogging and crucifixion. The flogging tore flesh open and tore flesh out of his body. It was such a horrific act that years later, the Romans said, we can't be doing this to everybody. And they changed because of the grotesque nature and the, the fact that, uh, to say it in the simplest term, it was inhumane to do to a human. And nevertheless, Jesus' followers made a point of remembering his death but they remembered more than just his death. They also commemorate that he died in such a shameful way, such a, a, a morbid way, in a way that was scandalous. We set aside one day each year for the celebration, the commemoration of Jesus' death. Do you realize how opposing that is to celebrating Jesus' life or my brother Miles' life or Miss Susie's or Nancy's life? We think of birth and life, but yet in this time, in this day, we commemorate and celebrate a very, very powerful emotional event of Jesus' death. Why is Jesus' death so important to Christians and so central to our Christian faith? It is because it brings certain freedoms. Jesus' death leaves us where we are no longer prisoners of the law. We are no longer prisoners of the law. Now, when we live under law, there's only two possibilities. You either observe it and obey it, or you don't observe it and obey it. And simplistically, we can say you're either right or wrong. Well, in the death of Jesus, we also find that we are no longer slaves of sin and passions. Now, why are passions mentioned here? Well, I can tell you from personal experience as a kid growing up, I frequently found myself hanging out with my friends on Friday night, and it was well past dark, and they all laughed and would point at me and say, your mom's going to come down the driveway any second and grab you by the ear and tow you home because it's after dark. We observed the Sabbath in terms of the Old Testament. And my passion to be with my friends, always on the forefront of my mind, always left me late in getting home to observe what we believed in that time. Other people's passions might be for a TV show, might be for football. Those passions can take over so much in a life that the life is left in a state of sin, in a state of priority being mixed up. Because of Jesus' death, we're no longer enslaved by death or fear. Now, what does it mean to be enslaved by fear? Why would somebody be enslaved by fear? Well, if you were a person who was held prisoner by the law, and you couldn't observe the law and obey it perfectly, and you were a sinner, there would be fear there. There would be perpetual fear of retribution, of 
disobedience bringing penalty. You know, I've been approached by multiple people over my life telling me, boy, your mom must have sinned really bad for you to have all these health problems and you're 60 now. What did your dad do? What did you do? Well, that kind of fear isn't exactly what we're talking about here. But death, have you ever thought of death in terms of acceptance? I'm a human. You're a human. I'm going to die in a car accident tomorrow. Oh, well, good. I'll go to my maker and everything will be okay. That is not the fear that we're talking about here. We're talking about the fear that comes from not being able to fulfill something, not being able to, um, to be free of torment and penalty. We're talking about fear of not knowing and not having something. Now, we're told we're not raised, we're not born, we're not taught in a spirit of fear or intimidation. So it makes sense, Jesus' death leaves us where we are no longer enslaved by death or fear. Jesus' death also leaves us where we have overcome the world and the evil one. Overcoming the world and the evil one. Why do we have to overcome the world? Oh, wait a minute, that's right. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Satan has current control over this earth, this earthly place we call our home. And Satan, Jesus' death, participation in living in his life and death leaves us with the power of Satan having been overcome and Satan being put in his place where God's authority reigns and rules, and his authority does not rule in a blanket, covers all, whatever he wants kind of way. You know, if you go through the Bible, you find many things that are said. God promises this cannot happen to you, happen to you if you were his child. God promises that because of this, you will not be eligible for this to happen to you, and he will stall, stop, prevent the hand of Satan from doing certain damage. Now, that doesn't mean bad things don't happen to Christians, but what it means is that we are given peace and given love through our faith that comes from Christ and that is perfected in Christ. You know, Jesus is listed as the first importance in Paul's summary of the gospel message. Modern Christendom today is beginning to acknowledge that Paul had a second gospel that he preached. Now, second gospel to what? To the gospel of Christ that the Bible talks about. Paul's gospel, which was a very short, focused, precise uh, comment, was what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. The story goes on. Paul focuses on the cross. That is the short story of what Paul taught, what he teaches. It is the gospel of the cross, which is within the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of mankind. Now, Paul characterizes his own preaching in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18 as the message of the cross. That was his preaching. That was where he started 
to tell the gospel story. We preach Christ crucified, it says in verse 23. Jesus' death was predicted in Scripture, and it was necessary. Luke 24 talks about it. So does Acts chapter 3. It was necessary not just for the Messiah to come, to die, but also to suffer. Now, it's bad enough that someone's going to be killed, but to have to suffer? If you're going to be killed, how do you suffer even more? Well, the answer to that is because of crucifixion for our salvation. Crucifixion, crucified for our salvation. The cross is that point where Jesus died and suffered significantly, enough so that he talked with his dad briefly about if there's another way, if you can take this cup from me, that'll be fine, but no matter what, thy will be done. Do you realize that statement by Jesus shows his humanity suffering? It shows the anguish he felt. But yet, he gave all, everything, retained nothing, saved nothing back for us, for our salvation. It was an essential part of Jesus' ministry and an essential part of the gospel. Jesus had predicted his own suffering and death, even his death on a cross. You can read in Mark chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10 that Jesus knew and identified the cross as the point of his death. He was positive. He was very sure it had to happen the way it did. Matthew 26 and verse 54 talks about that. It was Jesus' purpose and his mission. He had fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 53. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. We get the sense that Jesus was well aware, very informed, very knowledgeable about what was happening and going to happen. And yet, he gives his all and retains nothing. Jesus said his death would be a ransom to save other people in Mark chapter 10. At his last supper, he said that he gave his body on behalf of other people. Who is other? If I say those other people to you, what am I referring to? But we're referring to actually the people that are outside our walls outside our spiritual home. That would have been you two weeks ago. And so when we talk about other people, it is people that are not within the knowledge in the sphere of effect and affect that Christ has. Those other people are the people that don't know, don't understand who Jesus is, why he is, and what he is. He gave his blood to form a new covenant, the basis of a new relationship between God and humanity, based on forgiveness. You know, when Pastor Guy in Tacoma identified that the inauguration of the new covenant occurred and started its process on Palm Sunday, I was floored for a minute. I had to really stop and think about that and soak that in. When you inaugurate a president, do you un-inaugurate the one that came before him? Well, there's a passing of duty. There's a passing of understanding. When the new covenant was inaugurated, the acknowledgement of the old covenant being fulfilled 
and being put away in the sense of its value and use is present. Now, I don't mean to say the old covenant is useless. We must understand the old covenant and the Mosaic law are the mirror we look into to see who we are as carnal people. But yet, in that, Jesus inaugurates the new covenant based on forgiveness. Do you suppose there were some very, very sore necks when people snapped their heads around after being told, yes, even you, a Jew, and those Gentiles over there, live under a covenant of forgiveness, not a covenant of obedience and law anymore. What a shock. Can you imagine the scandal? Can you imagine the death threats? Because the entire religious structure was being put at risk by love and forgiveness. Luke 22, verses 19 and 20 talks about that. Jesus was, as Isaiah 53 had predicted, an innocent person who suffered and died to ransom the guilty. Guilty of what? Sin. Ransom? Wait a minute. I saw that in a Raymond Burr movie once. Oh, yeah. Somebody came and paid what was required so the innocent lady could get back home to her kids. He paid the fee the the criminals wanted, paid the ransom. Well, we are guilty of sin, and Jesus died to ransom us, to pay that fee that our sin demands. God laid our sins on Jesus. And he was killed for our transgressions to purchase our freedom, as we read earlier, from the bondage of the law, from fear, to purchase our freedom from those things. Jesus not only predicted his own death, he also explained its significance. And this is why his death is good news. The significance of who he is and was and what happened to him paying the ransom for the guilty to be free. Freedom. Now, what do you suppose the people of the day that were slaves wanted more than anything else in their lives? They wanted release from slavery. They wanted freedom. And that's why it's good news. He gave his body for us. He allowed his blood to be shed so that we would be forgiven. Now, when we look at the Bible and look at the stories of Christians, and we look at the way some Christians were treated, and we look at the pestilence and the terrible things that happened, One event jumps out at me. What was up with that painting blood on the post of the house outside the front door? What did you say, Cricket? Okay. What was the purpose of the blood being put? Protection, Eileen? Okay. From what? Ah, okay, so suddenly we come down to another term relating to pre-Easter, Passover. Protection from the death angel. The blood on the post covered who? The people in that home were covered. The blood on the post was a visible sign that others could see. And so when Jesus died, 
and he spilt his blood, and it ran down the cross, down his legs and down his toes and dripped off, and that blood intermingled in the dirt in the earth. Who did that blood cover and pay for? The world, everyone. Everyone. All who would accept and love and acknowledge Jesus. One body, one promise, one bloodletting, mankind may receive salvation. Jesus was the mediator between God and humans. That was another effect of his crucifixion. His death enables us to have a covenant with God that is a relationship of promise and loyalty. Wow. Promise and loyalty. Sure sounds a lot better than death and destruction. The death of Christ is the only way for our salvation. We know there is no other name that saves, the Bible tells us. There is no other person who was crucified or crucifiable to bring us to where we are in our religious freedom. That's why Jesus, even though he knew what pain awaited him, and Luke 9, verse 51 said this, resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He, he resolutely, intently, on a mission, very specifically and with significant motivation, set out for Jerusalem. And all this was the reason he had come. The resurrection of Jesus was good news, and it was a hope-filled message. But of that, it would have been easy for the apostles to emphasize Jesus' resurrection and skip over his shameful death. Indeed, we read in Acts that they preached the resurrection, but they also boldly reminded people of the shameful punishment that Jesus had received. Wow. When we have kids, we think of birthday parties. When we get a new puppy, we think of the day we get the puppy. When we get married, we think of the day we get married. When our kids get married, we think of the day they get married. But here we see the gospel story, the story of Christ. The disciples, the apostles, all preached the resurrection but they boldly reminded people of the shameful punishment Jesus had received. Wow. Now I'm sitting here thinking, and I'm remembering a couple of funerals when I was a little boy. A funeral scared the life out of me. To this day, it is one of the single things that I despise the most. His funerals. But it's because of this memory I have of hell that was taught by someone in my family. And it wasn't right. And I heard it, and those words stuck. But we've already heard and read that Jesus came to do away with that and not to leave us in that fear immobilized unable to function. We're taken past that. Not only did the disciples admit the cross, they also called it a tree, a word that would remind Jews of Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 and 23. It says that anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. Now, under God's curse, ooh, that sounds extremely serious to me. By using the word tree, the apostles and disciples drew extra attention to the shameful way Jesus died. Why did they emphasize it? Because it was important, obviously. 
The scripture had predicted it. Jesus had predicted it. It was necessary to accomplish our salvation. Paul did his best not to offend people when he gave his message of the cross. But he emphasized the crucifixion, even though he knew it was offensive. The cross was the center of his gospel. Paul gives the cross significance in this way. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse on our part. He was made sin for us. You know, when God is angry and when he is wrathful, it is towards sin, not people. It is towards disobedience, turning away the love of God the Father and the love of Christ and the love of the Holy Spirit. That's where his wrath is aimed. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He was made sin for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about that. He was a sacrifice so that we might be justified or made right with the Father or declared right so that we might escape the punishment our sin deserves, which is what? Death. One man, one body, one cross, one death. One payment, all mankind's debt for sin is paid. So that we might escape the punishment of our sins and what they deserve. He carried our sins on his cross. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Did you catch that? A righteous man dying for unrighteous men to bring us to God. Wow. One righteous man liberating unrighteous men. Through the cross, we can be given the blessing that was promised to Abraham. Now, I want you to think of something here. Abraham had a job to do with his kid. He took some of his men and some donkeys, and they went out to this place in the mountains. And Abraham takes his son and says to the men, "Uh, you guys go ahead and get ready here. The son and I, we're going to go over there, and we're going to worship, and then we will be back. What was Abraham's job in that assignment? To sacrifice his son. What in the world is going on in a guy's head that says we will be right back? He had faith in something. Why do you suppose Jesus said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do? Because Jesus had faith in something. What was it? Promise. The promise his father had made. Jesus had faith in that. Through the cross, we're reconciled to God. Through the cross, God forgives our sins, taking away the written note of debt that was against us. Our salvation depends on the cross of Christ, the cross of Christ. Can you imagine if the crucifixion and the cross did not exist, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the empty tomb, the empty promises of Christ that are there because of the empty tomb. Yeah, because the tomb's empty, I promise you'll get this. I promise you'll receive that. You'll be able to do this. Those promises of the empty tomb and the ascension of Christ would mean nothing because it would not be what God had put into place. Since we fail to keep the law perfectly, we fall under its curse. Galatians 3 teaches us that. We all deserve death. Jesus, being sinless, did not need to die. 
but he willingly died for us. The righteous died for the unrighteous. He received death so that we might receive life. Now, there's a gentleman whose name is John Stott, and he writes about Christianity. He wrote this. First, our sin must be extremely horrible. Nothing reveals the gravity of sin like the cross. If there was no way by which righteous God could righteously forgive our unrighteousness, except that he should bear it himself in Christ, it must be pretty serious. Secondly, God's love must be wonderful beyond comprehension. He pursued us even to the desolate anguish of the cross. Where he bore our sin, guilt, judgment, and death, it takes a hard and stony heart to remain unmoved by that. How can somebody turn down the rest of the love of God, being around Christians that love God and love people? How can somebody turn that down? When the weight of our sin, our guilt, our judgment, and our death has been paid. Thirdly, Jesus' salvation must be a free gift. He purchased it for us at the high price of his own life blood. So what is there left for us to pay? What is there left for us to do? Well, the answer is nothing and participate. Be in relationship. What is there left for us to pay? Nothing. But doing is being in relationship and participating. The cross was the focus of Jesus' mission as a human. His job wasn't done until he was crucified for the first part. The cross then, we see the promise like a fulcrum on a teeter-totter. All of a sudden at the crucifixion, promise has been fulfilled. His job was not done in part until he was crucified. Jesus did not tell his disciples to remember his miracles. They were to remember his death. How contrary to how we're taught today. The disciples knew and taught to remember his death. Jesus eliminated a lot of rituals in the church, in Christianity, in belief, in faith. But he commanded a new one, the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper. He told us to participate in these reminders of his death. Why? Because his death and our participation in his death is vital, it is necessary, it was required for our salvation. The cross is the point at which we see the story turn from what man did to what God did. After the cross, we have the burial. You know, in the Middle East, they're finding tombs that have stones like the story we read in the Bible about Jesus. And those stones are so big, it takes three 50-foot ropes and six big dudes to roll the stone out of the socket it sits in, covering the tomb. The tomb was empty. The ropes were broken that tied the stone to where it was. We would not know of Jesus' resurrection. Think of what happened to Mary and Martha. Um, it's me. Yes, I'm over here. Oh, my Lord, is that you? And then the ascension after his resurrection. Without the crucifixion, we wouldn't be here now. We wouldn't be able to set aside the road rage as easily. We wouldn't be able to set aside 
the despising, hateful dislike for something that someone else does. We wouldn't be able to set aside the anger that comes because there would be nothing motivating it the way it is motivated by Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, and ascension. We have reason to celebrate, reason to be faithful and to love and to be a part of God's plan and the Jesus story. The cross. Don't get tripped up over what it looked like and how the nails were being put in. Those details don't affect the promise of salvation and the new covenant of forgiveness. Don't get tripped up by how many hours it was until this or that happened because that doesn't affect that Jesus was alive and he died, was buried, resurrected, and ascended. Get caught up in what was, and that is his life his death, and his resurrection. We are here because of Jesus. We are here because our hearts were called to belief. We are here because we're given faith, and that faith we're given is the faith Christ gave us. We live in a miraculous time. One of the most interesting things is this little tiny church has seen miracle after miracle after miracle. You know, for those who don't know, in 2005 there was some conversation that took place and New Hope was a renter here. And that conversation brought Pastor Steve to a meeting of the governing body of the church that owned the property. And they said, basically, um, here, it's yours. You take care of it. You do all the work. We want to retire. I've got to go here with my wife, and everybody's got to go everywhere. So here's the deed. It's now yours. You own it. Not a penny. What in the world were we doing with four showers? in a sanctuary basement. Oh, God put that to use. And here we are 10 years later, and God provides a grocery store who feeds the community. We're wondering about how are we going to help these sick people. And King County The medical and dental vans are meeting down at a church down the way, and all of a sudden the church is sold, and the people say, no homeless, out of here. And the King County medical and dental van lands here. And it's central enough that people come in the bus to get help. And we didn't ask for that. God asked us to join him in that, just like we are asked to join Jesus on his mission. Don't forget, his death on the cross was the period of a chapter and a giant letter T for then Jesus and the story goes on. We live liberated, free. We live in a time and a place where freedom like we have is rare. Pray that God stops the hand of anyone who would come and try to possess our land. Do you know that is the only thing America has not endured, is occupation by a foreign government or a foreign uh, group of people? Jesus the miracle. Live it like he is the miracle. Live it because you know the story. Ah, that's a period. The big T is over here. And uh, 
it's important we don't just stop at the cross. I know you're having trouble with drugs and alcohol, but we need to go look at his tomb, and then we need to look at his ascension before you commit that you are going to fail at this. I got to say that to someone I met a couple of weeks ago. And sometimes in our short-sightedness, we take people to the foot of the cross and we stop. We leave them there. We turn around and go away. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. That's not how we're supposed to do it. The crucifixion was very, is very, shall remain very, very important to our salvation and the grace and the mercy in our lives that we have. Let's pray and conclude our service here. I'm going to pray for the lunch. Um, I know, like me, Miles likes to come for lunch, too. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for giving us everything that was required, that is required for us to be your children and to receive the full salvation and full measure that is Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your plan. We thank you for Jesus who did his job and walked in the role as you made it to be. And that the gift that goes beyond the giver is the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and what it brings to us in our lives. Be with us in truth, in knowledge, indeed, every day of our lives. Ask and you shall receive, you told us. And so we ask for more bread, the bread of life, knowing that you're not going to give us a rock. You're going to give us more of Jesus. Bless the food we're about to partake of. Bless everyone's coming and going today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.